Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Sharad Jaitley from New York. Thank you for watching, learning, and sharing on MoneyMeterHealth.com, your favorite website, which is dedicated to teaching human heart illnesses on this website freely to all. I thank you for your continuous enthusiastic support to watch MoneyMeterHealth.com on Facebook and on YouTube, which are the two channels where uh, you're following us or perhaps following on both. I really thank you for your continued enthusiastic interest and support in my cause of spreading the education freely to all. So without any further ado, I always say let's get into the state of the matter and that is the matter of the heart. And uh, today the matter of the heart is ASD, which is basically an atrial septal defect present as a congenital abnormality. So we call it, it's classified under congenital heart disease. And ASD is of four types, just so that you know. The commonest variety is the ostium secundum. And the second commonest will be ostium primum. And in a second, I'll define where they are. Uh, the third variety is obviously sinus venosus. And the fourth is the coronary sinus. So these are the four varieties that you will come across in your settings. Coronary sinus is extremely, extremely rare. So just remember that this is the rarest form. But if I was to draw, say, the heart, I would draw it in this fashion in my, uh, uh, my um, uh, calligraphic skills, if you will. And here, if I was going to draw the right ventricle, if you will, here are the valves, for instance, and these are your tricuspid valves, for instance, okay? So this is your RA, and this is your RV. Now, the, sin, uh, the ostium secundum, which is the first one, the first variety, it's normally in the situated in the central portion of the right atrium. The ostium primum is more closer to the tricuspid valve here. So that's the typical. It's more at, towards the bottom of the right atrium. Because remember, this is the roof of the right atrium. This is the bottom of the right atrium. And now the tricuspid leaflets come in. And this is where the additional congenital abnormalities can exist. So you could have, with ostium primum, a tricuspid valve or a mitral valve Cleaflet, I call it, or leaflets, uh, which are cleft. So you could have uh, these cleaflets. These are my terms that I have just, uh, so this way you remember it. Tricuspid valve, mitral valve cleaflets can exist within, uh, within the ostium primum variety. So just remember that. So And that leads to mitral regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation right here. So you could have a combination of these two. So, uh, so you have a murmur, which is from AST we'll talk about, and a murmur from TR or MR as well. The third variety is more towards the top of the right atrium, which is existing, and that is the third variety, the sinus venosus. Now, this is where the pulmonary veins come in because the left atrium is uh, situated right here. So the pulmonary veins will be pouring in here. So what happens is many times one can see in another anomalous uh, congenital uh, abnormality, which is existing with this sinus venosus type of ASD, and that is the pulmonary veins are draining into the right atrium which is again a left to right heart shunt, or they could be draining into the, into the superior vena cava. So the pulmonary veins could also drain into the superior vena cava because this is where the SVC is, this being the IVC. And the fourth variety, as I said, which is extremely rare, is somewhere here. So that's the coronary sinus, and that, of course, also has a very inherent abnormality that can exist along with the congenital um, uh, coronary sinus ASD, and that is you could have an IVC communicating into the into the corner uh, into the ASD here as well. So you could have an IVC which could be draining into the uh, into the right atrium as well, which is the coronary sinus variety. So these are the three or four kinds. These are four kinds of ASDs that I you know uh, commonly enlisted, but nevertheless. The commonest variety, let's say for all practical purposes, we are talking about with 75 to 85% of all your ASDs will be of this variety. Remember that. So this is the most crucial variety here. Now, most of the times ASDs, even in adult practice, you will see that they'll be very, very uh, asymptomatic. And many times there would be no symptoms even until the third or fourth decade of life. So uh, many times they could be presenting as clinical features where uh, an innocent heart murmur was detected by a routine uh, examination by a physician, a nurse at a school, and the adolescent is uh, referred to the internist and then to a cardiologist because there was some other auscultatory finding that the internist picked up or the cardiologist picked up. So the classic findings are obviously you'll have a wide, widely split second two, uh, second sound, widely split uh, 
uh, sound, which is the second sound of the heart. And uh, there might be a signs of right ventricular heave, if you will. And there will be murmurs from either an increased flow, which is through the tricuspid valve, this being the tricuspid valve. So you will have a flow, which will be a diastolic murmur, and that will be through the tricuspid valve. So that's the tricuspid flow murmur, I call it, almost mimicking like a tricuspid stenosis, but because of the increased flow. And then because you have your pulmonary artery, uh, which is uh, taking the, ex the extra load, sending the blood over to the lungs for for purification, obviously, so that can also lead to a systolic murmur from the pulmonary flow. So there will be a pulmonary valve flow, which is increased, and the diastolic flow that's increased to the tricuspid valve. So one is a diastolic murmur right here, so that's the, and this one is a systolic murmur right here. So that can develop. Now, it's very important for us to also see what are the, what are the other ways that these asymptomatic patients can manifest. So one, you know that uh, it's an incidental finding based on a heart murmur or a white split sound somebody heard uh, during the examination. Uh, a routine EKG, a routine EKG will lead you to uh, certain specific findings in an ASD setting. And one is you have an incomplete right bundle branch, for instance, and uh, that could be present along with, uh, uh, say, a right axis deviation. Now that could lead you to believe that there might be an ASD. So that's a good clue right there. Another clue is where you have a complete right bundle, and then you have a left axis deviation. Now, I'll remind you, this is a left axis. And then you have a first degree AV block. And you have a first degree AV block. So that could be the second clue that could lead you to that. And then, of course, signs of RVH. But then by then, the pulmonary hypertension is already set in. So that's a little later finding. But uh, that you don't want to see because by then, there's, you know, it, the case may be inoperable or whatever once the pulmonary hypertension is irreversible. So ECG clues, clinical findings, heart murmurs, these are the normal clues that can sometimes present. Now, if they do develop symptoms, then the symptoms are very classic, obviously. There'll be fatigue, for instance, in these patients. There'll be chest pain. They might have uh, other issues like uh, uh, shortness of breath. They may have other issues like uh, uh, palpitations, for instance, uh, uh, that can exist. So these are some of the things that can be present, uh, present at the same time. Now, once, once we understand um, um, the findings are very, very uh, different with our um, uh, patients uh, that we know that these patients are presenting with these symptoms and findings, then at that point, we decide to do an echo. Now, if you do an echo, obviously, you will be able to see an increased tricuspid flow, tricuspid valve flow, and an increased pulmonary valve flow. So both the flows will be increased. So one will be obviously a diastolic flow. This will be the systolic flow here. So this being the systolic and that being the diastolic flow. So both these flows could be ascertained on the echo and you could see uh, the signs of right ventricular systolic pressure being elevated. So these are signs of uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, if you will. So all these signs of pulmonary hypertension on an echo finding and then on ECG finding here would be evident uh, based on what the clinical features are, and that'll lead you to diagnose what kind of an ASD. Now, on the echo also, you can see the size, the location, exactly where the defects are in that order. Again, fourth is extremely rare, remember that? But these are the common varieties. But then you can also do a TEE, which is chance esophageal echocardiography. Now, specifically, so if you're, if you're, if you're, if the, if the transthoracic is uh, suboptimal or ambiguous and you're not too certain where, which defect and what the size, etc., is, then a transesophageal echo would answer the question. Very rarely you'll require a cardiac MR. Now, cardiac MR would, that would be only indicated if the T is also, if the patient refuses, because this is kind of a little semi invasive, invasive study. But uh, the patient refuses, then you can go for cardiac MR. And that will, of course, clearly actually de define very accurately where the location of the defect is, what the size of the fenestration of the defect is, et cetera, et cetera. And are there any further communications coming in from like the other anomalous, uh, um, uh, anomalous drains that I just talked about, like in the sinus venosus variety, specifically if you have the pulmonary veins draining to the right atrium, et cetera, et cetera. So these are come up the, some of the findings that you will see on ASD so far. Now, how do you manage these patients? Well, the treatment is very, very classic because these patients could be managed in the following way. One, you could do percutaneous uh, closure. So that's a device closure. So one could do a device closure in these individuals. And, uh, and these are very, very safe techniques. And specifically for osteum secundum, that's indicated, which is the commonest variety. So the, the, 
the it's a catheter induced device. It goes like an umbrella and sits on the other side of the left atrial um, septum and just snaps it and closes the whole defect right there. And uh, the only problem is you have to just watch out for the first six months so that no thrombi develops. So treat the patient with an aspirin for the first six months. And then, of course, endocarditis prophylaxis also must be given for these patients for, uh, for about six months, roughly, also. So, so six-month precaution for a device closure. And then the second, uh, if it's not operable, where you cannot uh, define the device, etc., or define the size of the thing, sometimes it's very ambiguous, even after a transesophageal or cardiac MR, or maybe it is a different other, uh, different other kind of ASD where devices will not, uh, you know, will stay in place for that uh, uh, indefinite period of time, you're better off doing a surgical closure. So there, of course, uh, the hospital stay is involved, and certainly, obviously, your morbidity is involved because, you know, you're, op uh, you're operating and uh, surgically and admitting the patient, into, uh, you know, uh, as an inpatient. So, uh, again, uh, six months of prophylaxis is definitely indicated even for surgical closure. But aspirin may not be indicated because uh, it's only indicated for device closure in the first six months post-device uh, post um, uh, placement. So having said that, as I said, now just a word about the genetics. I just want to say that in genetics... Uh, uh, there's a good 8 to 10% chance, unfortunately, for the offsprings to develop uh, uh, from a mother who already has an ASD. So just remember that in the offsprings, there's an, about 10% chance uh, for a child to develop that, which is pretty high. So it should be, uh, you know, genetically ascertained or do a pediatric echo, a fetal echo, I call it. And um, when you do a pediatric fetal echo, you will be able to ascertain if there's an ASD in the child. But then, uh, again, genetic counseling should be done to the mother and to the parents. Uh, the second uh, word of caution here or just notification here is chromosome number five. That's where the gene is. Now in the chromosome number five, that's where the gene is responsible for the ASTs and several kindreds have been, several families have been identified uh, genetically at various medical centers where they have a chromosome five gene abnormality which is responsible for ASD. And just a couple of other uh, interesting, peop uh, interesting uh, eponyms for some people who are very interesting, uh, interested in those eponyms. One is the Holt-Oram syndrome. Just, uh, just I'll spell it here. Holt-Oram syndrome, O-R-A-M and syndrome. And the other one is, of course, the Down syndrome. Everybody knows that. So the Down syndrome has the same uh, issue. Uh, ASDs can be present, and, but then other anomalies can exist. Holteram has the hand and the ASD problem. So hands are hypoplastic and uh, the ASD is present in those individuals. And that's what Holteram syndrome is. This is just for uh, people who are very curious about the eponyms. So in a nutshell, you learned about the ASD in this short video. Stay tuned. Continue to watch MoneyMeterHealth.com. Spread the word and get your interns, resident fellows, train, trainees and uh, everyone involved here. So this way we have a larger classroom across the globe and... Uh, Again, I'm extremely, extremely thankful for your support in this matter of my uh, spreading the knowledge uh, freely to all, uh, not only to the medical fraternity, but also to the general masses. I thank you again for watching MoneyMeterHealth.com, your favorite website on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks again. So long.